Uh, hello and welcome to Cobase Alpha. This is episode uh, 76 and we're going to be looking at our Z80 emulator this evening. Now it's a little bit earlier than normal start time. Um, I'm still recovering from a cold. i uh, still got a bit of a bit of a tickly cough so I do apologise if I do cough during the, during the show but uh, I'm feeling a lot better than I was last, last week so I couldn't possibly have streamed last week. I was kind of, you know, not in a good, good, good place at all. Um, it's been a really eventful day today as well, so it's a good good idea to, to start a bit earlier than, than the schedule. Just to try and um, get as much as I can in before um, I get too tired to continue, because it's quite it's quite uh, strenuous streaming, I tell you. Uh, it's, quite, um, it's quite involving um, in terms of, you know, you, you're having to speak and think and, uh, and code at the same time, so it's, it's quite tiring. So what I don't want to do is to... Um, is to start to flag too early. Um, we're not doing a, a shader stream this evening. Um, <clears throat> uh, Morton, who's uh, my uh, co-host on the shader streams, is having to do them to work. Um, and I do want to try and catch up with the um, with the um, uh, with the. Um, I've just realised I haven't got my headphones plugged in. Just a second. <laughs> I wondered why I couldn't hear anything. That's better, much better. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So I, uh, I do want to kind of catch up with the Z80 because I've done a bit, quite a bit of work on it. I haven't quite finished the the, um, the debugging environment, but it's nearly done. Uh, but what I have done is added a few more operation codes because that's the quite, you know, repetitive task that you have to do is add all these operation codes. And I've got to a stage now when I've got possibly three four hundred and about three hundred and I don't know exactly how many I've got but quite a few done and I thought well it's probably a good idea at this stage to start thinking about implementing our um, our validation suite now, this is not the unit tests I've written but this is unit tests that other people have written specifically unit tests for um, a project called fuse uh, which is the free unix spectrum emulator and it's quite a famous project it's out there on on the internet on sourceforge and um, it has a, whole, a suite of about 1,300 tests which um, have been written, um, which I can use to validate uh, my Z80 processor. These are the tests that to validate their uh, Z80 uh, emulation. So I thought, well, I can use that myself, but we have to actually uh, write the code which will run the tests. So I thought that's what we could st at least start that kind of process this evening. Um, I'm not sure how far we're going to get or how it's going to go, to be honest, but. What we'll probably do is um, is start off by trying to get the tests to actually run, um, and not worry about why they fail, but try and see if they do kind of succeed or fail. Let's go over to the uh, the code, shall we, and see what we can see. Okay, so we're here in um, a class that I've got called Fuse Tester. It's in my uh, test project, and this is um, a class I wrote uh, or I began to write a couple of uh, months ago, really. And basically what it does, it reads the test file and the uh, expected results file from the Fuse, um, from the Fuse library. And basically it loads those into memory. So it loads them into, um, into a uh, pair of dictionaries here. So we've got the tests and the expected results. Um, and uh, it should enable us then to actually run them. Um, TGB. PBG Gamer, thank you very much for the raid. So this this is at the inauguration of our raid celebration. So thank you. This is uh, what we worked on um, a couple of streams ago. This is Alf, Rocket Powered Alf. So thank you very much for the raid. Uh, Ancient Coder, welcome to the stream. Good good to see you. PBD Gamer, good to see you as well. So there's uh, Rocket Powered Alf. So that was our our um, <laughs> our quite fun uh, stream. Um, uh, fun uh, shader that we did last time. Okay, so as I was saying, we, what we want to do is be able to kind of automate the running of this uh, suite of about 1300 odd um, validation tests and then at least get some kind of report at the end of it to see, um, you know, how well we did. Um, so, where can we start? So, the code we've got so far uh, will read in um, a test file and it will basically populate. Um, <clears throat> A couple of arrays or lists in this case it, it populates a, um, a set of registers which correspond to the um, oh yeah 
Yeah, I'll just call you a year. Thank you very much for the follow. Have some have some electric elf hype for the uh, for that follow. So thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Um, this is electric elf. Um, elf is our um, is our uh, alien crew being here on the code base. So uh, he's uh, celebrating that follow. So thank you so much. As I was saying, we're going to load our registers. So this is, corresponds to the A and the F register, the B, C, D, E, these 16-bit register pairs that we have within the emulation. Uh, we're going to load something called states, which we may or may not use initially. Um, and these are things like the value of the interrupt vector, the refresh uh, register, um, and the, 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 um, the interrupt flip-flops. But so we probably won't look at those initially. And then we've got blocks of memory. So this, these memory blocks are either set up um, commands or operations which are going to run or memory address locations which are going to be read or updated um, and then we've got basically exactly the same kind of thing for um, for the uh, expected results so we've also got this thing called events and an event basically breaks down the operation into um, yeah thank you legendary movie yes I do like my uh, my shaders on the stream they're very very cool um, the events breaks down each operation into um, kind of sub operations at the CPU level, and I haven't actually implemented anything like that uh, in my uh, my CPU emulation. So we won't be using the events, um, at least not initially, um, until I find a way that I could possibly kind of record what the events, individual kind of memory reads, memory writes, uh, ex operation execution kind of phases are. Uh, in my emulation and then I might be able to read back. So what we're going to do basically, we're going to start off by we're going to set the registers up, um, we're going to ignore states to begin with, we're going to load the memory, we're going to run the program in the memory and then we're going to compare it with the state of memory um, after and the state of registers after and if they're the same we know we've passed our test. It sounds relatively simple but actually you know it's I don't really have a good idea how we're going to approach this so it's going to be a uh, a voyage of discovery for all of us. Okay, so let's um, let's have a look. So we're going to want a a method that we can run, which is going to actually um, which is going to um, actually run the test, don't we? So let's um, let's start with a public method. Probably avoid, and um, we'll call it run test. And um, we'll start off like that. Right, so what do we have here? So read test, read fuse tests file basically reads our test, test files and populates these dictionaries here. So what we should probably do initially is, is read the fuse test file and then read the test expected results. And I can't remember what I called it, there we are. Read the fuse expected file. We we'll start off like that. Okay. Now the, the way the files are structured, I'll just show you one of these files. This is the test file itself. It starts off with a name, the name of the test. And as you can see, in most cases, this is uh, actually the operation code. This is no operation, zero, zero in hex. And that's the, um, that's the, that's the test we're going to run, that's the command we're going to run, we're testing. So um, yeah, what's the goal of the project? Um, oh, so we are running in a test project, uh, Legendary Move. So we're in the Z80 tests. At the moment, what I'm planning to do is is running through this whole suite of tests. I want to produce a report. I've got about I've got a whole suite of unit tests. As you can see here, I've got something like uh, 267 unit tests so far because we're building the, the application um, in a test-driven kind of manner. So each time I create an operation within the CPU emulation, and um, we write the tests first, and we write the operation. And to answer your question, that the initial objective of the project is to create a new get package, which will be an accurate emulation of a Z80 processor. So that's going to go up on new get, and anyone can use that. They can grab grab that and use it in their own projects. Uh, 
Once we've got an accurate and validated Z80 pro processor emulation, we're then going to move on and try to emulate a classic Z80 system. So it could be something like an Amstrad CPC, a ZX Spectrum, or there's plenty of those around. It could be a Game Boy, it could be any kind of um, system which uses a Z80, Z80 processor. Um, I'm probably not going to go from a game oriented um, stance really. I'm probably going to start off trying to emulate something which can run a disk operating system such as CPM, which is like the DOS of its time back in the, in the 70s and 80s, probably 70s. Um, so that's kind of the project. Um, there's a kind of a side project I'm doing as well, which is to implement um, a theoretical processor called MMIX, uh, which is a 64-bit um, theoretical processor, which um, was created um, by uh, Donald Knuth and it is part of his um, Art of Computer Programming books. It's actually the updated version of the MIX processor he, he's created, or he has designed in theory. Uh, and it's a um, it's a very powerful RISC-based uh, architecture, um, capable of addressing enormous amounts of memory through to the 64 bytes of memory, uh, and it's it's quite a different beast to a, a Z80, which is an 8-bit processor from the 1970s. Um, so there's a kind of a parallel project going on in the background, which is a bit more challenging than this project because. A lot of people have done a lot of work on Z80s, uh, so they're quite well known. Whereas uh, MMix is, was, there's, there's no real processor uh, called an MMix processor, so it's a bit more kind of theoretical. So it's a lot of mathematical kind of background to it. Which, um, if you've ever read um, or tried to read any of Donald Knuth's books, they're absolutely jam-packed with mathematical notation. Um, so I'm currently rereading uh, Fundamental Algorithms, Volume One. Uh, which is a book that I received as a prize for chemistry of all things many many years ago and I'm rereading it now and it is hard going uh, but it is fascinating stuff so um, I'll probably present the MMIX M uh, simulation uh, much uh, much closer to its, to its completion because it's, that's quite a difficult um, a difficult project and probably not very suitable for streaming okay so um, as I was saying the, the first line here the test name is actually the opcode we're going to test and sometimes there's an underscore one or underscore two it just means there's two tests for that so that the opcode we're interested in is actually the, um, the O2 in this case whatever opcode O2 is and we can find out what that is by going to our, our code base um, over here uh, look in our instruction table and O2 is uh, load load the accumulator um, with the so we load the memory location pointed to by the memory the uh, register pair BC with the contents of the accumulator. So if you kind of been following along this kind of short series of project Z, you'll get used to that kind of notation. But that's the assembly language, um, the data assembly language kind of mnemonic for uh, instruction O2. Um, but we're not too worried about any of this tonight. We just, what we want to do is look at trying to run these tests. Uh, if we run one test initially, that will be sufficient. So the first test here is uh, a test of the no operation um, opcode. So we start off uh, with the name of the opcode, 00, zero. And then we've got all the registers, all set to zeros. We've got some state here, which is we're not going to worry about this first time round. The pudding, welcome to the stream. Good to see you. Yes, buzz, buzz. It's, it's the S&B, yes. Uh, we're not going to worry about these states here. Then we've got some memory, memory location zero. We're going to put the opcode zero, which is no operation. And basically, the result will be nothing happens. If we go and look at the result, the expected results for that first operation, we can see that um, the operation zero, zero, the test should return everything zero. This uh, one here is the program counter. The pudding, thank you for the host. Let's give you a RAID equivalent. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, the um, the program counter will have been incremented, and um, well, that's about it. Memory um, is not unaffected in this case. So there's no memory um, locations. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's not an animation. It's a shader. So let me explain to you. This is actually being generated in real time. 
it's um, a mathematically based shader so everything there has been generated um, by GLSL in real time so it's different literally every time you see it apart from the the ALF uh, figure there the rocket plume is actually being generated in real time uh, probably due to um, many many um, mega flops of um, GPU processing but yeah the shaders are fantastic so we have a series on shaders so uh, um, do, do catch up with that on YouTube so that's it this is what we're trying to do so we want to run the no operation and we expect nothing to happen okay apart from the program count which is this register here being incremented okay so let's have a look so actually this is going to be quite challenging because we need to figure out how many how many steps to run the processor through so that's going to be quite challenging so there's going to be some some difficulties involved in this whole process okay so let's see what we can do uh, so we've, um, we've devised our run test um, method and we're going to read in the test file and the expected file so the first thing we need to do we're going to have to loop through uh, all of the tests aren't we so um, so we have a dictionary um, so we're going to say um, for each first thing we want to do is to pull out the name of the um, test we're going to run okay so the name of the test um, is actually the key so um, the test name is going to be test key and we want to know what the operation code we're testing is of our uh, of code equals um, so we're going to have to take um, what's to the left of any underscore so um, the test name split with a chart part of that so that's the opcode um, we're going to need to create a CPU aren't we okay so let's um, let's have a CPU so private Z80 underscore CPU um, up here before we start we'll create the CPU it's going to be a new Z80 and it'll start off um, it'll start off in its kind of pristine form so let's go and have a look at our Z80 we should have a reset command which we do So this will reset our, our processor and we probably want to do a hard reset so the first thing we can do is to reset our processor Oops. okay so cpu reset and we'll do a hard reset which is equivalent to kind of powering off Okay, and then we need to connect our CPU to a bus. Right, so that's interesting. So we need uh, we need some memory, and uh, we need a bus uh, to connect our CPU to them to its memory. So 
I think we're going to need to have an actual implementation of the interface IBUS. The interface IBUS here has just these properties. Uh, the read and write peripheral are unused currently, uh, so it's read write and then a read only collection of um, the RAM. Hmm. Why did I choose a read-only connection? Okay. I can write to piece of it, but okay, that's fine. Okay. So we're going to want to create a um we're going to want to use CPU connect connect to bus and we're gonna to have to pass a bus a bus in there okay so we're going to need to have a dummy uh, bus with some memory attached to it So each time we run, we're going to want to, re to kind of re reset all our memory. We don't want to have um, we don't want to have the contents of memory being persisted between tests. Okay, fair enough. So what's the best approach here? Then, so we've got a a, a basic bus over in our debugger, and our basic bus. Um, sh this implementation should be perfect for us. So let's let's copy the basic bus, and we'll pop that into our uh, our classes here. Okay, so that's going to be uh, we're going to need to create an instance of basic bus, aren't we? Um, a new basic bus. And we're going to need to go and just tweak the namespace desktop classes. Okay. And we need to set the initial memory. Base up. So let's go and have a look at how it uh, tests. So they're using quite, they're using potentially all of the memory available, 64A of memory available to us. So I think we're going to pass in so our basic bus. We pass in the RAM size in K. So we're going to pass 64 into there. We can pass in. We can pass in our our memory as a, a predefined array. Hmm. I think we're gonna. I think this is not gonna be. We're gonna start off doing the simplest thing that can possibly work. I think. So we're gonna pass 64 into there. Now I have a feeling we're going to need to recreate our connection to a bus each time. So. Let's initially, and this is not how it's going to end up in, once we've gone and done our basic tests and refactored things. For each test, we're going to connect to a brand new bus and throw the old bus away. So we're going to get fresh memory each time. Copper Beardy, welcome to the stream. Good to see you. I've been, been enjoying your, your algebra streams. Uh, I've been kind of lurking. I haven't said hello in many of them because it's been been quite quite busy and, and uh, distracted, but. I'm enjoying this. A good idea to go back to basics with some algebra. I hope you hopefully you get quite far with that. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Okay. So we've got an opcode. We've got a CPU. Now on the CPU, there is um, 
there is a method called is supported. I can find it is opcode supported. Now if we pass our opcode in there, we should know whether we've actually got have we written that opcode the code for that opcode yet, which is going to be quite important. So we can say if the opcode is supported, then we're going to do something. So let's have some counters. Um, let's have um, private int uh, test passed. Private int failed. Initialize these to zero. That explicitly, and then private. So initially what we're going to do is simply report some totals as ignored and we're going to increment that. Okay. So if the opcode is supported then we're going to want to ex execute the uh, we're going to want to execute command on the CPU, won't we? We're going to run the test. Okay, so we need to set up our CPU um, so that the registers match the registers in the expected file. So we need to get our our value off the um, out of the um, dictionary. So we've got test. Uh, so var um, test to run is going to be our value. Okay, and then we're going to say, okay, what? So what's what s dot value comprise of? Let's uh, let's stick a breakpoint here, and let's run the program, shall we? Can we do that first. And perhaps not. Perhaps the best thing to do. Perhaps the best thing to do is to just write a bit more code before we try running it, because I need to figure out. Um, what values we need to set up. So we've got our registers. So let's extract our registers. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll move these into a method uh, eventually. He's a bit tired where you copy birdie. Well that's that I'm afraid that's one of those um one of those kind of um problems about streaming is I find it very tiring so and these people who do the kind of 24, 48 hour marathons are just like amazing. I don't know how they can do that. So, um, so if our registers is going to be equal to test to run. Not registers. And uh, our memory. And that's all we're interested in at the moment. So we're going to ignore state and the events of the um, and the events uh, that are in our expected file because we don't have any any way of generating kind of the events ourselves. So they're putting what's Project Z? Project Z is is a uh, project to emulate a Z80 processor. So the Z80 processor is an 8-bit processor from back back in the day. It was kind of um, found in lots and lots of, uh, of the early machines uh, which I, I came across as a what was in those days called a computer hobbyist. Um, so things uh, 
ports such as the Amstrad CPC, um, ZX Spectrum, uh, even things like the Game Boy has got a kind of a kind of Z8 in it, and lots and lots of other applications for this 8 bit CPU. Uh, it was all over the place. Um, and it's still used, and it's still produced to this day, and it's still used in some applications. Obviously, not there's so much computer applications anymore, but microprocessor, no, microprocessor applications. Uh, so what we've got here is uh, an emulation, or, the, or the, the basics of an emulation of the Z80 processor. So if I just say this for you, I'll kind of show you what we've got. Over in the Z80 uh, class, we've got all the instructions that I've written so far. So there's there's hundreds and hundreds of them. This is the assembly language that you see here. We also have a debugger which we can run. Um, I'll run that up for you so you can see it. So this debugger is written in WPF. Oops, where have we gone? Here it is. Okay, uh, so we've got like a, an area for disassembled code here. We've got our memory and we've got our um, internal CPU registers over here. And what I can do, I can load a file. So the, I've got some hex files I've created here. So I can load a multiplication program. You can see it's, it's disassembled the program here. This, this is the machine. This is the kind of the assembly language. And off in this starts at, at memory just 8,000 hex. So if I go to 8,000 hex down in the memory, and I haven't yet figured out how to make this automatically scroll to the right place, but I'm hoping someone with some good WPF skills can clue in how to do that. Here you can see the machine code. So this is the machine code we're going to run. And what we can do, if you, if you watch up here, these are the, the registers. Um, we're going to multiply uh, 15. Um, I think we're going to multiply 15 by two. I can't remember the exact result, but then if I step through, uh, you'll see. So the first thing, the first command is load register pair BC which is here with the number 15 hex. So if I step in you can see 15 has appeared in this register, 15. Next bit we're going to load B which is the upper part with a 08 by step. Now we've got a 08 in there. Step again uh, we've loaded 2A into DE etc etc. So as we run through the program you can see we're doing some jumps and then eventually we'll drop onto the the knop, the no operation. Uh, there we go, we dropped onto the NOP. And so now this is, we've got the results of the calculation basically held um, held in the um, in the registers there. And so a lot of part of the emulation is to actually kind of make sure these flags are being set correctly because the flags decide how these um, assembly language um, statements actually uh, operate. And this, you know, obviously making sure these registers get correctly. And that's what we're trying to do today, is to just run through a test suite to make sure that I haven't got any errors. So I've got about 267 unit tests that I've written uh, that test in individual instructions, but I wrote them so they're susceptible to me making a mistake, a logical or a um, just not understanding what the command is supposed to do. Uh, so we, what I'm trying to do today is to... Um, is to run an independent set of um, validation tests written by somebody else. So we've got about 1,300 tests we can run. So, oh, uh, yes, it reminds you of how you programmed microcontrollers this semester. It was painful. Yes, so this is how um, this is how computers were programmed. And, and, and indeed, I don't know if they still are. Mostly, I guess, we're using high-level languages these days. But for any kind of micro controller or, my, or, or, or dedicated kind of processor, people are going to write, be writing the, um, the code in the semi language. One of my colleagues at work, he um, was involved in the automotive industry in developing um, anti-lock brakes, ABS systems, back when anti-lock brakes were kind of new. And he wrote all the code in uh, semi language. And you can imagine if you make a mistake in that and they go and test that beyond the Arctic Circle and the frozen lake and you get it wrong, then, you know, it can be quite disastrous. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting stuff. You had to use assembly language for your labs and the idea was terrible. Well, I hope my ID, my ID is not an ID, it's just a, um, it's just a, uh, a debugger really, so 
them. I'll use somebody else's assembler to, to build the exiles. The assembler is very difficult. It's not that hard if you use a simpler CPU with a pudding. So um, I cut my teeth on the 6502 uh, chip, um, which has got only about 256 commands. Um, the Z80, I, I did program for briefly. It's got a lot more than that. It's got several hundred different commands. Um, and it's quite powerful for its time. Um, but modern processors, I would certainly agree, if they're not risk architected, the modern processors have uh, many, many, many commands and must be quite hard. So yes, it does. You, you're correct. It does give a lot of control over the system works. Um, it, but it is so you're working at the machine code level, so you, you're working with moving bytes around in, bet, in between registers or between the CPU and memory. Um, so you're working at the lowest possible level. And the kind of in, interesting part about it is that you are working. Um, you can't get any faster. So if you write um, if you write your machine code correctly, it will be the fastest way that the, the CPU could possibly run those commands. Obviously you can write bad assembly language which takes longer than optimal but there is actually an optimal um, an optimal code for a program written in assembly language uh, and we can argue to the cows come home about you know what's best in C sharp or in C++ or in Haskell or whatever but the fact is you can prove that um, your assembly language is the fastest it could possibly be because we're working in basic clock cycles um, so we know how long each instruction actually physically takes. It can't take any quicker. It can't be any quicker. So each command has a time, and we're emulating those times as well within the program here. Not that accurately yet. So we're not running at kind of um, four megahertz speeds that um, that Z80 is ran at. We're running at the speed of my processor, which is a, you know, a hexacore Intel i7. So it's running a lot quicker than it should do. But eventually we will kind of building routines where we can control the clock speed so we'll be able to have you know a turbo button or we'll be able to just have a sliding scale where we can say make it faster make it slower so that's kind of the the there's this, this kind of endless things we can do uh, but at the moment I'm trying to kind of build all of the all of the opcodes um, and it's quite a, it's quite an involved and tedious process so um, I don't kind of show that build that stage all the time on stream we've done a few um, streams where I've built opcodes um, but this, I think, is, is, um, is going to be interesting to see how many I've got right and how many I've got wrong. So the pudding, assembly language is supposed to be give you the highest control of the processor. Yeah, absolutely. So you're working at machine level, absolutely. And it's, uh, assembly language is a lot better than um, than actually inputting binary digits, which is, I think, I remember one hobby computer, and I can't remember which one it was. There was one called the Scamp, which was an early Sinclair machine which you programmed it in hex all it had was a, a hex keyboard well a hex keypad and then a row of LEDs and that was all it, I think it, it, you might have been able to plug into a VDU I'm not sure TV uh, but of course back in the day when I was uh, first starting out in computers um, as, a, as a hobby and um, then um, we kind of I think my first computer had 8k of RAM which was seen as being enormous uh, and you load you to program some cassette tapes uh, yeah, back in the day but you know this, this, these kind of things have a, a certain nostalgic value these days don't they okay we've got our registers and we've got our memory so let's deal with the registers first we need to load we need to initialize our our um, CPU so uh, initialize registers and we pass in the CPU and uh, registers so let's start off with that to clear that method and we'll we'll just pop it in pop it in that position um, okay going to make this this is a list of ints currently so these registers 
we're going to make we're going to change our definition i think if we can so we're going to make this a list of view shorts and we're going to make this a list We may have to change our program design as we go along here, but a few shorts. smaller integers which is going to help us a bit later on. So registers. This is going to be a list of U short. U short standing for unsigned short integer, so 16 bit unsigned integer. Okay, registers hex. So these are Convert into int thirty two. So can we then cast that as a U short? Yeah, we can. Um. I think we can probably cast that as a byte. Solve that problem. And then down here we'll cast this view short. Oh, we'll cast this as byte. Okay. So we've now got our register here. Our array of registers, our list of registers. So, okay, so let's think about what the process is going to be. So I think we'll write it longhand, we'll write it in the kind of potentially the worst way possible first. If I go over here and kind of grab a bit of code, help us out. So, so in our tester, we're going to have A register and the F register. That's going to be denoted by the value which is in uh, registers zero. So our first register pair is AF and because these uh, registers are 8-bit registers we're going to have to kind of drag those out. So C underscore so CPU we want underscore CPU, don't we? We don't want to pass a we don't want to pass the CPU in. We want to use the pair that we've already got. Okay. And underscore CPU dot F. Right. The problem is that this is a flag register. So the register F is not um, represented within my emulation as being um, eight bits a byte as such it's represented as a set of flags so it's this is this enum here which is essentially um a byte as you can see we're just shifting the bits around uh, so it's a one shifted zero to the left one to the left two to the left um, but we need to cast it to be a, a type flags let's do that in this case we can say just say flags And we need to bring that into our application. Okay. 
So we're going to have to do this for all of us just to pass. So let's go through, then we got B and C. Uh, which is going to be register pair number one. And D and D. If you have any questions about the, uh, the project, just fire away and I'll answer them as the best I can. This is not going to be flagged, it's going to be bright. So, um, yeah, said the very basic controller used had 32 bytes of RAM and 2K of ROM. So, so yes, it made you think about using memories. What one thing we never do these days is it is think about that Hello World program I just wrote. It was four megabytes. Yeah, that's big, isn't it, for, for just saying Hello World? So yeah, we don't think about it anymore, which is quite interesting in its own right, really. Um, we just start resource rich back back then and in and in any kind of microcontroller or um, embedded system we don't have gigabytes of ram we have you know, just small amounts and, and and using that oh yes i'm sure fuel stable welcome to the stream fuel stable and i'm sure you do think about it quite often um and that's good um, but most programmers and i'm probably in that camp until i'm until i'm um, faced with performance issues while I need to optimise. Do I think about it? Hmm. I kind of know which, in the in the kind of world that I, I work in, I kind of know what's quick and what's not. So I tend to use the quicker type, but do I optimise to the nth degree? I don't think I do. So these uh, A1, B1 are the equivalent of the, uh, of the um, registers above. But these are what's called the shadow registers, uh, and we have to um, make a note of those as well. So we got D1, D1, H1, and L1, and after that we've got. Luckily, we've got a bunch of. Um, 16-bit registers, so we can say that, and we need to just increment these, don't we? So this is going to be register pair 3, register pair 4, I'm sure there's a better way of doing this, but we're going to just stick with the simplest thing that could possibly work, which is kind of my, as my, my philosophy, we, we do that then we refactor. We may not refactor on stream, but we do refactor eventually. That's the first 8 registers done and we've got CPU and the next one is regi index register X which is going to be um, which is going to be registers uh, 8 CPU and got register index register Y once again a 16-bit register and having 16-bit registers you know, in your CPU, pretty impressive for the time. Um, the CPU is capable of 16-bit arithmetic, which you know a lot of them weren't. So I'll just roll back on. The, it looks like an interesting conversation going on. So uh, Shulsev says you, you refuse to use Newton soft JSON because you don't want to pay one megabyte for JSON parsing. So do we know if the system.json um, library that comes with .NET Core, is that is that better in terms of bloat? Yeah, it says we have to store five music files and have the control light up LEDs for different notes. Display uh, and show and, and display show the note and be able to switch songs. Took all the memory control the controller had. That sounds like a really interesting project. So that's, is that at university, yeah? Because that sounds a lot of fun. I think I'd like to do that. Fuel Snowball says you avoid unnamed classes in C Sharp for the same reason. Oh, Tree Shaker, yes, so uh, Tree Shaker, that's part of, that's .NET Core, is it not? 
Reflection, we know that reflection is powerful but slow. Try to intermit 64-bit using 30-bit 2-bit electric uh, arithmetic in portable C, not easy, no. No. You're a senior in electrical engineering year, that's fascinating. So you, so you must be really into the kind of the microprocessor type, type of stuff then, unless you just like, like to plug in plug in the um, uh, the ICs and uh, and just get it working. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to build a microcomputer myself. Uh, but my kind of ele uh, electronics knowledge and my soldering will let me down. System.json is, uh, uh, is built in, you paid the price already, so you might as well use it. That's a good point. But is it better? Because didn't they employ the Newton soft guy? Or was, or, or was, he, not, was he already part of um, part of Microsoft? I can't remember. So registered. N will be stat pointer. CPU. So the program counter will be um, register. 11 and then we got a thing called mem pointer uh, which so I'm going to just go to I'm going to um, I'm going to have to uh, have a, a private variable for initially. This is going to be a, a new short. all this up I promise eventually and um, then we have uh, the mem pointer is an interesting thing so um, it's not a real like, it's debatable whether it's a real thing inside the CPU but we need it so that's registers and it's basically a, it's to facilitate our, to facilitate our testing Newton Softguard works at Microsoft. I thought he did, yeah. So yeah, you focus on power delivery. We have a, a track for computer architecture and embedded systems. You love working with code though. Yeah, so um, I'm sure it's a, a very valuable uh, skill to have in your field of electrical engineering, I must admit. It's, um, I, think I'd be, I think I'd enjoy the electrical engineering degree or electronics degree. Um, okay, so we've got our initialized our registers. Now we want to initialize our memory. Okay, so initializing our memory. I'm going to put that down there. So what do we want to do here? We've got a list of list of bytes. Is a list of list of bytes. Is that what we actually want? I don't think it is. So what are we actually reading in? Are we reading a start address? Reading a start address. Our text we need a start address and then we read a sequence of bytes. Okay, so maybe that change I made wasn't the best idea. Let's think about this. So our memory. One or more records of this type. Start address, byte, byte, byte. So 
I don't think having this as a bite is the best idea. This needs to be a U short as well. Um, in fact, we'll just leave it as being whatever it naturally comes out, which is an int. Uh, and we'll convert it when we need to. So that was probably a poor change to make. So let's say this is a list of ints. A list of a list of ints. So we've got a list of ints and we want to set our memory up uh, to be... Okay. So for each... going to be mem block zero, isn't it? So each block of memory, we're going to be given a, a bunch of records, each of which is a block of memory. The first item in that list is going to be the start address. And then we're going to place the bytes that follow, and they are bytes in this case, um, into that address and increment until we get, until we get to the end of the Lock. Okay, so this is going to be, um, we're going to cast this to a U short. So now we've got a memory address. So, and we're going to say uh, for each. Okay, so we got our, we're going to have to go through the memory, but we don't want the first item. So we could do with pulling the, we could do with moving this from the list. Now, if I was using something like F sharp, that would be an easy thing to do. So I want to, I want to split my, my list, don't I? So mem block. If we say, if we use the, the new um, notation, we do that. Do that. 
not null here. Okay, so let's do that so we get the data. And we're going to do uh, CPU dot. That's why I've not got to write, can't write a CPU. Um, so we want to say, uh, you have to pass in our plus. Um, okay. Our Z80 class got on it. I think we've made them private. The right, the right. The basic bus got on it. It's got. Oh, it's got a right. We can use that. Okay. Um, so, I think the best thing to do is to now uh, set a basic bus. So let's Um, initialize memory. Let's that. Turn into our, our initialized memory area, um, and we want to say something along the lines of let's connect. Uh, do that last. Then here we'll say uh, bus equals new basic bus. Remember our, ba our bus is what's going to enable us to connect to peripherals, in, in this case just memory at the moment. And the basic bus needs 64k of RAM attached to it. And we're going to feed bus into there. Um, and here we want to say um, bus stop right, and then we want to put in um, start address. We'll just call this address. Address, and then item as a byte. And then we want to increment. Connect our our CPU to that bus with that RAM setup. Okay. With that being a read, it, it's going to be difficult, though, isn't it? Because we need to be able to read. We need to be able to read the um, memory. So I get the impression that this needs to be. Another private variable. So we'll try this. I think we're pretty much making up as we go along. So that's that's the way we sh we probably should should tackle this because it's fairly fairly linear the process we need to go through. So we should be able to work out at least an initial pass through this process. So we initialize the memory we, and we connect our CPU up to that bus. So we can probably just bring this back out again. And we initialize our memory and we can then connect CPU up. Uh, we've, we've initialized 
initialized each time we initialize a memory. So that should refresh our memory each time we go through a test. Reset it up. Okay, so that seems okay. Okay, so our program counter should have been initialized to the start of our program. And that would have happened here. That'll point to the beginning of the program. Um, any other data would have been set up in our initialized memory as long, along with our program. We need to really need to know how long, how many we need to know basically how many program steps to go through. So what are we looking at? Initially it's simply one, we're going to run one command, but you can see here is that one command or two? I think that's one command. As we get lower down, who knows? Let's scoot down towards the bottom. It looks like we're running a single command each time. If I, if I. Two is a single command. So we're going to assume for the moment that it, they're running, we're running single commands. Okay. Well, they make that assumption, and then we'll have to we'll have to address that if it's not true. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is to actually execute whatever the program counter is pointing at. So in this case, the very first time it's going to execute a um, a. Uh, and no, no operation. So, yeah, you've got to go. Thank, thank you, um, thank you for popping in. It's really, really nice to see you, and very interesting what you're doing. So, do pop back and tell us more about your your course and what you've uh, you've done on that. Really interesting. Should use a raise over list anyway, probably if you're stable. It's not reason for it, not use it for any reason. It should probably should be an array. You're absolutely correct. We'll go back and make those changes at some point. Let's just get it working. Um, or should we just change it? A list of arrays. Maybe we could just do that. Um, not what I wanted. I didn't want to use an array, did I? Let's just leave it as lists at the moment, and I'll think about that if that should be a list of... be like that. We'll make it a list for now. Mainly because it's... because I'm not sure how to size... how to size it initially. So we'll leave it as it is. Okay. So let's um, this stage we'll we'll do one step. Execute one command. See what happens. So that should um, update all of our um, all of our registers and memory locations if they're affected. So again, let's have a quick look where we've got data. So they're preloading the registers with these addresses, so it should be okay. I'm not sure stepping once is going to be sufficient. And I think we'll step because the rest of the everything off the end of here past the minus one will be no operations. What I'm going to do for safety's sake, I'm going to step twice, and then we'll revisit and, and look at individual uh, tests and see what happens. So if we do step twice, that should that will run two commands, and if it runs off the end of our um, of our little program, it will just be running knots, no operation, so it wouldn't do anything. 
Okay. So now what we need to do is to um, compare what happened with expected. Compare actual with expected. So what does that actually need to do? We've read in our our Now we need to pass in we've got the status CP we need to pass in the um, the expected file don't we this is called expected expected yeah that's expected into there and it needs to have the key of test name does the expected uh, results are keyed in exactly the same way as our test so for example if we add 0 f underscore 01 then it would be the same for our expected Not all results will have any memory changes in them. So, for example, the very first one, um, we don't have a memory block, whereas here we do. So, this says that, um, so for 02, 02 underscore 1, 6B65 should contain the value 1, 3. Those. That is this one here. Six five six B could be loaded with one three. And that, that is correct. That's the value that um, if you go to the test, that's the value that's in. That register there, I think it was. Okay. Right. So now we just do some tedious code and board left right left hand right hand star code and just see what happens. So uh, so let's look at registers. Now we're gonna be able to use our sixteen bit um, but all of the 8-bit um, register pairs we've got have got a um, bit of syntactic sugar on them to um, enable us to read them as a 16-bit value. So this makes it a lot easier. So for uh, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Code Rush, for helping me. So AF 
see if compare. Um, we'll say that uh, underscore CPU dot AF is the same as expected registers. And then we got the shadow registers, so AF, AF1, I wish I could use the prime symbol that you get to use in F sharp in Haskell. I've been looking at Haskell recently, I might think about doing something with Haskell at some point, fuel stab if you're interested. I don't know exactly yet. But it looks interesting. And I think we could probably do some interesting stuff with it. Coming up with a project which is um which is of interest to other stream other other kind of stream viewers really. Um that pointer program counter I think there was a fair amount of interest in the parser combinator stuff we did in F-sharp, but I don't want to repeat that in Haskell. Although I might do it myself as a learning exercise. Um, I was quite... because I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of kind of... Um, reading up on some mathematical um, st things at the moment. And uh, I was quite interested in the Haskell's, um, Haskell's notation for um, expressions and for um, list um, comprehension is extremely um, extremely similar to mathematical notation it's just like the same which is um, makes it a lot easier when you're kind of working from a mathematical text yes form form combinators do you think they'll will they work okay in the Haskell think uh, they well, should do shouldn't they yeah that'd be great Okay, so are the registers the same? We've got a whole bunch of booleans here. I mean, this is, this is not, not very, not a very nice code. So we're going to need to store the results, aren't we, somewhere? Let's just get it get it running first, so we get basic passed or failed. So we're going to return. Ooh. Return value is going to be true. And then we're going to just go and compare these.
Yeah, there's many ways we could do this. We're just going to do it the simplest possible way for the moment. This is horrible code. Don't. This is just kind of first cut, first attempt, get some working code. So don't emulate this code. Or don't copy the code, rather. Do emulate the CPU. Program counter, oops, and then pointer. You think it's an F, F sharp stream? We could, we could convert that to a Haskell. Um, I know it's not a random choice. <laughs> Your stable, yeah. Should I generate the code using T4, absolutely, yeah. It's so repetitive, isn't it? It could just be done automatically. So we're not going to look at the memory for now. Point there. Okay, so we need to run this. We need to try trial run it. So let's see what happens when we uh, try to run it. So let's um, I'll just pop a fake test in somewhere, so uh, ZADM later should. And we'll create a fake thing here, which won't be actual XUnit test. Um, so we should um, pass or validation test, because we know it won't. We know it's not, that's not going to be, it's never going to pass that until I've completed all of the code and I haven't completed the code by a long short sure, Still a couple of hundred commands to go before, before we can even look at that. So this is, um, the rest of this Z8 emulator is actually running um, assembly language programs and comparing the results. This one, we won't, we won't decorate it with the facts, so it's not going to be a test as such yet. It may end up being a test when we figure out how to pass the, the values around, but then we're going to, just going to say um, var tester, new use tester. And then we are going to uh, say tester. Test. And we're going to see what happens. So let's uh, let's just pop a break point in here and try running it. We 
can make it. We can make it. Yes. Okay. Let's debug that test. Our test name is going to be 00. We split out the opcode and that is code 00. Is it supported? Yes, it is supported. So now we have 13 registers, which is correct, I believe. And we have our one block of memory. Uh, initialize the registers that should all be initialized to zero anyway which they are uh, and then we've got our memory memory should be simply zero and zero because it's at memory location zero and no operation of the command we connect to the bus we do two steps of the cpu that's that's it's not two clock cycles, it's two complete um, complete commands. So hopefully it'll get our targeted command and if we if the if it needs to do another one it'll be either two commands or no operation afterwards. So hopefully that should sort it out. So compare with actual going there. All these should be true. And we can false it. Okay, that's interesting. So, am I not initialising my shadow register? Oh, these are not. Okay, everything else is true. It says the program counter. It's stepped too far. That's the problem, isn't it? So I have to. I'm going to have to step the correct number of times. Can't just step twice because the program counter will be out. Uh, so where am I doing that? Step once, and I guess we'll find out where it, there's an error. Okay, well, let's let's run it. Lord knows how long it's going to take. Quite a long time, I thought. So let's take that opportunity to. I'll put the old wine glass. So if you're snowball, have you managed to avoid having to um, do much work tonight? Or are you still on call? I, I've just not managed to achieve anything today at work. One of those days where everything is yak. If you don't understand the expression of yak shaving, it's like when you have to, you're constantly revisiting problems and you're fixing problems which have nothing to do with what you're trying to test. It's been one of those days, just the nothing. You aren't calling if you're snowball out. Just uh, hope and pray for you don't actually get called out. But it's just taking quite a long time is not surprising because it's so inefficient the code I'm writing but that's okay for the moment might again just getting things to work so what I might do is uh, break point in there if you can if you can get break point into a running program oh it's actually finished is it finished Oh, I ran it and didn't debug it, did I? Oh, no, that's why it's finished again. Let's um, actually debug it. Silly me. Okay, we've hit here. Let's run one command. Okay, well, let's pop the breakpoint just up there and continue. So it ignored 1072 failed 299 and passed 55 that's a bit demoralizing 
<laughs> Jinx, you're on call. It wasn't too bad last week. Perhaps this week would be good as well. Yes, that's yeah, always a jinx. It's like um, it's like a, my development team has to be on call over the Christmas break, and we always say, "Well, we never got called out last year." <laughs> I say, "Well, it was always the first time." Okay, so we've got fifty-five and hundred, so quite a lot of ignored tests which is probably what I expect. Did I expect over a thousand ignored tests? That's demoralizing that must mean I've got over a thousand commands to still write but I don't believe I have. So there might be quite a lot of combination tests involved in there. Only 55 passing is a bit a bit poor. Okay so we've got a uh, the basis of it working so let's actually go and get us some more information. So what do we want to do? We want to know which test passed. So we, we're going to want a, um, a list of past tests, don't we? So private information in uh, about the fail tests. Debug. Rito. Good to see you. Okay, so uh Pure Stamper says uh we run services supposed to run twenty four seven. When they run into problems, engineer gets a call. That makes them run 24/7. Yeah. I, I was once on 24, 24/7, 365 on call for a company, and it was terrible. I wouldn't like to do it again. So we told you, chatbot went crazy. What happened to it? Did it did it did it strike out for work, work world domination? Did it become Skynet and? Uh, so let's have a look at our, our passing test. What's in passing test? 55 of them. Come on. Okay, so interesting that we've got some failing tests quite early on. None of none of the high order ones passed really. Hmm. 
find that. Find that difficult to believe. So it says that test three failed. The reason why I find it quite hard to believe that there actually really are failing and it's skipping so many is that we've successfully written assembly language programs. And none of these are the none of these are um, multi-byte commands. Only looking at the single byte opcodes. And all these non-implemented ones are going to be like it's all the multi-byte which is a bit weird mind you I probably haven't done many CB commands but if you go down there's, there's ones we have done okay well we'll take it at face value and then have a look about why it thinks they're failing so we need to add some more information So for failing, we're going to make it a list of, stri uh, list of strings. We're going to make it a list. Uh, we're going to make it dictionary of string and list of strings. We may adjust what that is. Start off by thinking maybe that's the data structure we want. Okay. So down here we're adding It's now going to return a tuple Ooh. and a um, list of strings. And now we're going to return rec val and details. So then we can say var. Details equals a new list of strings. Add. 
expected. Uh, we're going to use the um, some interpolate, some string interpolation here. Expected. And we'll, we can, we'll pull this out in some kind of decent method at some point. Let's just get the code written. Sort it out. We'll sort it out eventually. I'm just interested in the fact we get so many failures. I'm, I'm surprised. I thought we should get a much higher degree of success than we're getting. I want to see what they're failing on. Because if it's failing on something where I'm just not comparing the right things, so it's my comparison program which is wrong, that would be great. But if it's actually because the code is suspect, then that's more worrying. And we need to find out which of those it is. So this is HL. Lower the music volume, sure, Cam. Is that better, Weasel? Let me know. It's actually quite loud in my ears, so it's, uh, it's quite a good, good idea to lower it a bit. Thank you. Yeah, ne never be kind of afraid to tell a streamer that they're quiet or their music's loud because. Um, we don't necessarily know. It's interesting on Rumbling Geek stream over the weekend um, on Friday, he had all kinds of, of audio issues, and he didn't realise he, he had them um, until people pointed out. And then once it was pointed out, he was able to kind of have a fiddle with his um, new setup, new audio setup, and get it working properly. But unless people uh, kind of shout out and say, mm, "There's something wrong with the audio," then we just carry on. I remember there was a, a stream that Morton and I did a couple of weeks back where I was very overmodulated and and luckily someone woke up early on so I was able to correct it. But of course it went out onto YouTube with uh, within the first 15 minutes um, with overmodulated audio which wasn't great and I'm I'm not in the I'm not able to spend the time to go back and post process or re-record audio for um, YouTube so everything goes out onto YouTube exactly as I um, I record it here so that pointer See, some of it could be the fact that the um, uh, that the program counter is not correct and if it's failing on program counter it's because we're not stepping enough uh, for the command so it seems to be interesting to know what the details of the failure are here's the program counter um, maybe that I will not include the program counter. Um, or it could be mempointer which is failing on, in which case I'm not so worried about mempointer at this stage. If it's mempointer it's failing on all over the place, um, then um, 
it could be on off by one hours as well. Yes, definitely. If it's Mempoint, then I'm not so worried because Mempoint is a weird kind of feature, which, uh, although I do want to get right, I'm not guaranteed that I've set the Mempointer variable in each case. You don't stream, but uh, you would, if, if you would, you would uh, want someone sort of monitoring the output of your audio. So, so one of the things that um, sometimes you need to do is to do some test um, test streams, and you kind of invite a few. It's easier now we've got this kind of sub-only um, streaming concept, but um, it, it's certainly very useful to uh, invite people to, to a stream where all it is is just basically testing the, uh, the audio. See what we see with that, shall we? And obviously, the reason why it's actually quite quick is it's not doing half the tests. Well, not even, it's not doing most of the tests. It's only doing about 300 tests. Okay, let's have a look at the framing. See what this says. So each of them has got one. Some of them got three, but most of them are one, aren't they? Look, uh, so there's some that which have got more kind of serious failures. But let's have a look at what, um, say for O3, what's that? This mem pointer, expected zero, got that. Okay, so let's uh, let's not do me let's remove the test for mem pointer for now. The mem pointer. Um, I don't really want to go too much into it, but it's there's some weird behaviour of the Z80 processor which people have observed, and they've tried to explain it in many ways. And one of the ways they've, they've explained it, and, and which has proved to be the correct thing, is to postulate that inside the Z80 there's a, a mythical or a uh, unconfirmed register called mem pointer, and um, it's not referred to anywhere, and it's apparently not used. Um, anywhere but it does seem to be involved in some um, undocumented processes that go on, uh, features of the, of the CPU uh, so we want to get all those right but what we don't want to do is to um, demoralize, demoralize ourselves when we don't understand what mempoint is supposed to be doing a particular command so this will be interesting because what I can do is, is comment everything is at mempointer out and then go and analyze where apparently I'm getting mempointer wrong and it could be, I mean, it could be a number of reasons. So, um, but I'm surprised that it's not initialized to zero. Yeah, it's it's quite surprising. So let's run this again. The so Weetal, you do a lot of audio, video work for conferences. Well, that's great. You always have some triggers on, uh, on voice. Yeah. Not sure if those numbers make uh, sense for OBS uh, or the stream. So, is that decibels? Less than 12 decibels, you know, minus 12 decibels and zero. And if you put it in terms of decibels, I can probably relate it to, um, yeah, so I can relate it to OBS. So currently uh, on the music, we're at um, minus 35 decibels. And on voice, I'm at minus 15 decibels. No, that's wrong. I'm at minus 20 decibels on the music and minus 2.8 decibels on the voice. Um, so, that, so that obviously means more to you than perhaps it does to me, but um, I've done a little bit of audio programming, as you know, so I do kind of understand the, the idea of the decibel. Um, let's run our debug our test again to see what the results are now. The test ignored are, are, are interesting as well. It's ignoring a lot more tests than it should. So, test passed. Doesn't really 
oh it's improved incredibly so so we've gone up from 55 passing tests to 242 passing tests the failed test are failing on numerous counts let's have a look at so operation one zero fails and it says that the program counter expected for got one and the bc expected one got two two oh four eight interesting so that's ten one zero so let's let's analyze that a bit so test one zero that's this one here it's got some memory so it does you see it does a no operation for some reason there so it's not actually running doing a no operation which is why it's failing so why is it doing that why has it got zero zero there if it's just running operation 10 that's that's wrong isn't it it shouldn't be doing that So the expected results for operation 10, 1, 0 I should say, so what is 1, 0 then? There's an awful lot. Hmm. Have a look. That's a, ju that's a jump decrement and jump. So it's going to it's going to it's going to go through the BC register decremented until there is and jump while it's non-zero. So it's jumping back to that no op, which is what it's doing, and it's going to run many many times, and which is why we our um our, our test is failing. So we need to be smarter. We need a we need a run command. Okay, well that's that's useful to know. So that's that's a loop. Basically, we we got, we're looping around so many times and it's failing because we're only, we're only doing one instruction. We're doing a knock and that's it. We told you Rally wants stuff to be between uh, peaking at zero. Yes, so we we we. It looks to me like we're peaking. We're peaking in the yellow of my voice meter here, and it's peaking at yellow, uh, about zero decibels. Um, minus 2.8 is great, so okay, yep. Yeah, so if I get into the red, that's when I start getting a lot of overmodulation. Um, yeah, so we get the bad, bad sound, yeah. So I'm, I'm peak, my peak marker is just about just over the um zero decibels uh, for the music my peaks are at just over 30 depending on how low the actual track is because it's a variable obviously volume on the track so currently i'm peaking about 35 minus 35 decibels on the music and i'm peaking at well that was yeah that was 0.5 decibel on the voice, which is just marginally into my red meter. So, um, yeah, but it's good to get the reports, uh, and I appreciate a report from a professional. Okay, so we understand why that one failed. Let's have a look at another one. So, what else failed? Oh, I need to run it again. So if we can get some explanation for why these are failing, I can just 
sort out the test program, which is obviously the problem. So, 2 4. But it's completely wrong. PC expected 1 got 0, so it didn't even run anything on 2 4. So, test 2 4. I thought that should run okay. It didn't do anything. So two four. What's two four? Increment H. Okay. Let's have a look. So we've got seven three in there. Um and it was seven two, so that should have incremented. I wonder what it actually was then. So it's saying two four. HL was completely wrong. Wow. Okay. And why is DE different? DE isn't even involved in Operation 2 4. Hmm. Let's have another look at that. So the test simply puts. 7200 into register AF HL and then simply increments H. So, I guess the thing is to go and have a look at that command. Stop it here. So that was increment H. I want in car. Here. Yeah. Okay, so what we're saying is that this is going to increment, going to read from register, increment the value, and assign back to the register. we do when we get a situation like this we have to write a test so this is in the increments part of the command so let's go over to our um, so it'll be 8-bit arithmetic our tests for 8-bit arithmetic Let's see if we can find ink. Oh. The current file. Increment was fixed. Okay, here we go.
Yep, let's write another one. So, we want to experiment with operation 242424. That should be H. We're going to set uh, H. 72 lock is in the test we just done and we expect it to be 73. Uh, let's have a quick look at the, what 73 looks like. Uh, 73 in hex. So that's parity, it's odd parity. So that parity should be false. Parity is the number of, um, is it even or odd, number of ones in there. Um, bit 3 is not set, but bit 5 is. The so bit 3 is not set, but bit 5 is. So true. Um, not a negative number that's um, false don't know if there was a half carry probably not so let's give that a go and see what that as a test gives us and that is in the 8-bit arithmetic logic I need a fact marker on it. That. Run that. That pass. According to my test, if I run two four. It increments the H from 7.2 to 7.3. According to the program here, I wonder if there's a misalignment. So, no, 2 4 is there. Why is that changed? That's the flags. Okay, it's saying that two zero is the flags. So hex of two zero means we've got zero one two three four. Bit six is set into that. That wasn't a, was that a failure? Let's run the, run the test again. There were three failures on that, weren't there? Um, that's this. This is already throwing some interesting results up. Um, Two, four, three phase it's saying key EB. Oh, looking at the wrong thing, aren't they? Why two four is working? And there two four is there, look. Two four is saying that it expected thirty two got zero. Okay, well that's slightly more worrying. H had expected You see, got expected one got zero. It, it's almost if it didn't run anything. Ooh. No, that is odd because it should run two four, and that's it. 
Okay, well, we shall have to... Um, we shall have to... Uh, a conditional break point where... Um, where S name before okay so one two four So that's up code 2525. The test name was type 25. The one afterwards. Why is it broken there? You're doing a bit of fiddling now yourself, not work related. Okay, it's always good to, have, to actually play with um, code during. Uh, Oh, it's broken on the previous test name is 24 that's the previous value so i want test key equals 24 down 24 let's stop conditions let's stop key i love these uh, conditional breakpoints very nice Jasplano, thank you very much for the follow. Have some have some electric elf to celebrate. One of our shaders, which our good friend Fuel Stable built for the stream. Still gone to two five. Well, let's do that then. No, no, two four. Okay, is the opcode supported? Yes, it is. Let's run these the values. So the registers. They start off with zero, except they've got. Um, I guess that's. 7200, let's check. 7200 in hex. 7200 is 29,000. Yep, 184. And what we want it to be is 7300 at the end of the operation. Twenty-nine thousand four hundred forty. Twenty-nine four forty. Okay. Initialize our registers. Initialize memory. Set to the bus. So what's the me what does our memory have? So we should have two four. That's two four in position zero. Program counter should be set to zero. Program counter was eleven, which is set to zero. CPU program counter is set to there's the program counter zero. So when I step, we should be able to go into here. Program counter set to zero. Pick the instruction. Next instruction is instruction is in cage. 
is what we expect it to be. Four T states. We're going to now go into tick. We're going to actually tick what one cycle of the clock. Oh, the clock cycles is not being reset. Okay. Okay, that explains that. Well, kind of explains it. Um, so, clock cycle. We need to temporarily, or at least, we need to be able to update the clock cycles. Um... best way of doing that we need to do it doing a reset uh, so we'll say um, block cycles equals zero as part of a reset okay and then in our test scenario here for each test we want to reset our CPU so we can do that here oh I wonder if that's going to make any difference Link Slumps welcome to the stream good to see you just Blano thank you for the uh the comment. Yeah, I do, we do like our uh, our our um, electric alpha. I'll show you what else we've got. We've got uh, some other nice little, um, shaders which we use on stream. This is what we usually use when someone subscribes. It's hyperspatial hype. So that's like a uh, fractal, Julian fractal, I believe, with our alien buddy on it. And once again, remember these are all being generated in real time. They're not animations. They're actually programs that should be running on our GPU and then we've got our RAID this is the latest one that uh, Fuel Stable and I worked on a couple of weeks ago this is our RAID uh, animation or anima RAID shader and that rocket plume is all being generated from mathematics in real time so yeah. I do love that <laughs> Alf blasting off yeah fun isn't it okay uh so we've hit our break point there. Reset the CPU from the test. And we hit the bus step. Hit the details. And we pass this time look. So I think that was causing us issues. So if we remove that break point and continue. Now hit here. Now we get 274 passing, and we get 10 failing, which is we get in the right direction. So 10 failing. It, the ignored ones, having 1,072 ignored, is a bit worrying. But 10 failed. So once again, 10 zero. We know why that failed. That's because it's we're not we're not doing enough CPU steps. There needs to be. Um, many more steps to get that to work the 2f that is failing because the flags are wrong and now so getting flags wrong is interesting so 2f what's that so command 2f so 2f is So CPL, CPL. Okay, so I've got my trusty um, Rodney Zacks programming the Z80 book here. You just you just um, stumbled over the stream. Well, we do quite different types of projects on stream, and at the moment we're kind of intermixing um, the shader streams where we build things like those animations you just saw. Uh, as well as other things and I'll show you what we've worked on uh, and, and also uh, a few other um, 
other projects with this this Z80 emulator is one of them there's also an old school text adventure as part of my bot that we're working on but I haven't worked on that for a while now if you want to um, have a look at what we do in the shader streams and hopefully there will be a shader stream we're planning for one for next week uh, all things being well um, if you get a shader toy shadertoy.com and on here you do a search for codebase alpha Um, then you'll find some of the shaders that we've built on stream and you'll be able to see exactly how we built them because we built them from scratch so we've got this one here which is a, kind of a shiny sphere rotating around a shiny cube um, we've got kind of spheres colliding but the one we're all most proud of at the moment is this one which is our um, terrain shader so this is flying over a rocky terrain with um, you can see there's ice on the mountains with the proper kind of snow lines there's lakes there's forests there's mist in the valleys large lakes with um little waves that the sunlight ripples on um, and clouds as well which move so that's um, the kind of stuff we've been building you know, got a comment yeah cool which is nice isn't it <laughs> oh yeah that's the kind of thing we've been building um, and also I'll show you um, what um, my esteemed co-presenter on our shading streams has been up to and there's a rather lovely uh, shader that he built um, just recently um, you can find it These are fantastic. I mean, looking at some of these, you can see the origin of the uh, the Alf um, electric Alf there. Um, is there more than one page of this? No, oh yes, there is. So this next shader, uh, then I'm going to kind of vote to be. Um, oh, we've got a problem with it. Interesting. But it's very Doctor Who like that. I click the name. Uh, where do you want me to click the name? Go back. Name cog, infinite cogwheels. I can see it working here actually. There we go. That's got to be the new Doctor Who. Uh, opening titles you just put the Doctor Who theme over that lots of kind of clockwork cogs whizzing around I think that's beautiful and, uh, this is the kind of thing we get up to on some of our streams but today's a different stream it's a, it's a Z80 stream so I'll say I've got my trusty um, Z80 programming manual here DPL because uh, I don't remember what that is even though I've coded it CPD, CPDR, CPI, CPIR, CPL. Complement the accumulator. So obviously we're doing our complement incorrectly. So that's a good catch. So um, the test has failed genuinely for that one. So what did it actually say it failed on? This is why this, this suite of validation tests is going to be so valuable because even my, my unit test might pass, you know. Not necessarily saying that I've got everything right. Unit tests are generally only as good as you imagine the scenarios. And obviously there's lots and lots of scenarios here. The 2F. So we're saying that the, um, basically you got the flags wrong. Which is, it's not, they're not that wrong, so um, if we bring back our, uh, our uh, programmer calculator, what we're saying here is uh, that 2F 
the expected value was oops expected value was at three oh we write this down hover over that an expected value Mouse is not wanting to cooperate, so let's do this again. There, there. Once, hover over that, please. The riveting stream, isn't it? This bit. Three, O, oh, two, five, eight, and it got two, two, six. Okay, so let's feed those into our calculator. So in decimal, we expected three zero two five eight. So we, we want to look at this the, the last byte of that. So that's o o one one o o one o. But we actually got. V O three O two two eight, I think it was. Three O two two six. Three O two two six. So we got zero 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 one zero zero one zero. So we got we got a bit one correct, but we got bits five, four, we got bit five wrong. We got bit five wrong on that. So let's go and have a look at what that could possibly be. So. Uh, over here in instructions we want CPL which is here and the reason for that we're not setting our undocumented flags so if I grab these two these three lines and pop these up here Okay, if we now run that again and debug, I'm hoping now that 2F will disappear from our list. And indeed, I believe it has because we've gone down to 9. Come on. Yep, so 2F is no longer there. And I'm wondering now, if we look at these, it's they're all they, I bet they're all apart from the first one are going to be problems with our flags. So A is the accumulator register and F is the flag register. The accumulator is unlikely to be wrong, but the flag register, especially with these undocumented um, commands could well be wrong. So we've got B8 next. Let's go and have a look at B8. What's that? Um, so we need to go and look at B8. B8 is CP and B. Let's go and have a look at instructions. We want CP. This is a compare. Probably be CPR. Set comparison flags. We are setting the undocumented flags in that case. So I wonder which flag is going to be different. This is quite complicated code here. Um, so there is definitely scope for getting something wrong here. So 
So let's have an investigate of this one, and we get get kind of a flavour for what's what's um, what's wrong and what's not. So let's run our validator again. Okay. Um, so test failing, failing test. So uh, B8. We're saying we expected. And hold this in the correct location and right. We expected six two eight seven four. We got. 62770. So once again, we need to turn that into uh, the binary representation and look at the lower byte. Um, so, the calculator. So, what we expected to get was 62874. The lower byte for that is 1001. One zero one zero, and what we got was six two seven seven zero, which is o o one one o o one o. Is that right? Let me just check the previous version. Six two eight seven four. Oh. That was one O O one one O one O. And what we got Six two seven seven zero, which is O O one O. So it's completely, it's very different. So um, the lower byte is different in that bit three, which is an undocumented flag, should be set, and. We had bit five set, and it's got bit seven set. Well, that's interesting. I don't think we're going to be able to sort that out tonight because at comparison flags, if it's negative. Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, we're going to have to look into that, I think, because uh, I need to recreate those. So what we do when we find this kind of thing, exactly what I did before, is to recreate the test as a unit test, put the results it's expected, and see why it's going wrong, um, and see what we can do in changing this code so that we get passing tests and we don't break any existing tests. This is what the support that the test driven development thing gives you. You've got all those unit tests to support you. And the reason why I'm going really heavy on testing, especially in bringing this um, validation test to him, is that I want to do major refactoring of my code. And if I didn't have those unit tests to support me, I could just break everything and I'd never know. I'd just blindly do refactoring. I would never know that I got it wrong. Let's have another look at what else we've got. Um, so what, I'd like, what I'm interested in figuring out is why we, why it's thinking so many are non-implemented. So let's have a look what it's, it thinks is non, not implemented. It's saying that CB00 isn't implemented. Um, and I didn't. I think it probably isn't. 
let's have a look at what we have got implemented in terms of the multi-bytes. Um, so these are the single byte commands. Then we've got the DD. So you've got DD09, for example, is implemented. And yet, none of the things that we're, that's going through the tester appears to be more than one byte. So what was that? DD09. DD09. Okay, and then the fuse tester is saying that... There we go. It's a lot of them, isn't there? DDO9. DDO9. It says DDO9 is not implemented. Okay, so let's let's do a quick test to make sure that my code which determines whether something implemented or not is working. So we have a test for that. So this is uh, is supported should. Let's go into here and let's grab this fact. And this is DDO9. I wonder if from that so it didn't find it our produce one's complement is failing why is that ooh that wasn't failing before a bit weird isn't it? Why has that suddenly started failing? So it says that plug U which is bit 5 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 bit 5 is indeed set so that should be true That's a bit strange Bit three, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, bit three, is, oh, bit three, zero, one, two, three, bit three is. Oh, this is me because I just added those, um, yeah, that's why it's failing. Correct. So I added the, um, added the, the, um, the two undocumented flags. Okay, that's, that's good. We've picked that up. Now, according to that, uh, it's supported, it's passing is supported good O9 now maybe it's looking at DD09 like that and that again and that's failing so my code is bad isn't it so let's go and sort that out over in our Z80 we have um, is supported is supported again 
No, I didn't want to revert it. I wanted to make sure that that my um, my uh, fix, which was to do the two upper, was work um, just plano. So um, indeed, when I go back here, it's still lowercase. You know, uh, so now we should get we should get more uh, passing tests or more uh, things considered at least. So let's go back and run our uh, passing. Uh, validator Let's see if we get any more so it's not implemented is it was and oh, that's gone down by quite a lot the failing is now 24 fair enough passing has gone to 420 I'm quite pleased with 420 passing let's see if we get any multi byte ones in here This is an, one of the cases, uh, Jasplana, when you see that you know, I wrote the tests um, and I wrote them from one mind mindset that the input was going to be an uppercase. And the first time we hit this, oh, it's actually got lowercase. So I hadn't really anticipated that, which is why I had passing tests, but actually it was going to fail. So we're, we're now considering DDs. DDs. Interestingly, no multi-byte FDs. FDCB I would expect it to see. So FDCB. So let's go and look at that. That's why you don't write tests. You have to fail them. Yeah. When, when you get, especially when you get a program like this, writing the test is so valuable. So let's have a look. Um, so we want. Oh, okay, right. I see. This is an interesting problem. Okay, so the reason why some of these large multi-byte ones like DDCB and DD and FDCB aren't being run is because they break <laughs> they break the pattern of how opcodes are, uh, are, are generated. They actually have the uh, the, the long um, prefix here, DDCB, and then the next byte is actually not a command. It's actually a displacement. It's, it's a, a signed byte, and the opcode lives on the end. So in this case, what we need to do is kind of when it's this, we need to we need to chop out. We need to say yes, yes. So we need. This is fine, but we can actually improve our code by going into our Z80 again in this bit here. Um, what we can do here. Saying if it's a length fix. So we, we pinch out 0 to 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then we are 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so what we need to do now, we've got the 2 upper. Oh, this is this is complaining, it wants me to put in a, um, a culture. Um, this is going to be then, um, let's see, I think. Okay, um, I've got like a um, star cop thing running on this this project, and it's complaining about that. So, which is why normally when you do a super, you do not pass a new culture info instance into there. But it's being very very harsh on me and trying to make me be very accurate in that in how I I compare strings. So I've got the kind of US English US comparisons going on there. Um, so if the opcode so 
if the opcode is that, that should cope with it. So let's just change out. Let's have another test. Is supported. So let's try um, this test. So we're saying um, FDCV. So let's get chop out the O2. We'll make it lowercase. FDCB. Um, in fuse. So Let's see if that passes the test. Uh, it's supported, should. Run that. It does. So, we should now, in theory, be able to run our fuse tester again and get a few more hits. So, we've got something like 400 passing, weren't we, before? So, in the passing now, we've got how many? 431. Have we got any of the long multibytes in there? Yes, we have. So we've got, because there aren't many of them coded yet, so we've got some DDCBs and we should have some FDCBs as well. FDCBs, yeah. So we've got. We got much more coverage now, and our not implemented is down to 898. 898 unimplemented opcodes is a bit demoralising. How many failing we've got? 72 failing. So oh, 27 failing, which isn't too bad. And passing we've got 431. I think apart from the f that loop. There's going to be other other loop looping and branching commands which aren't going to work properly on the test, and a lot of them are, are going to that's failing are going to be for flags. Chaplano, uh, I wouldn't care if it, it if it wouldn't cause any other problems. Uh, I've been setting a culture info default, so I don't detect in many places. It's a good idea. I'll have to look into that. Um, I, I only recently applied the kind of star cop. Um, it's actually Ros's analyzers I'm using. Uh, which are kind of like a star cup type thing and um, so I hope I've just kind of just whacked in a um, culture info but yeah if you can use if you can set a default that's interesting because I hate having to keep putting all those culture infos in, in instantiating um, classes that do nothing really for me that, he that don't help me in this case um, is a bit annoying kind of wish that it hadn't used to set up the, the analyzers really okay so I think that's looking pretty good what we wanted to do really is to actually return these results back to the calling program though uh, so currently uh, run tests is uh, void so we're going to want that to return um, our values back so I not implemented our failing and our um, passing so in theory we don't really need to have these numbers anymore because we've got the counts of the um, of the of the uh, list so we can remove those from our code um, mem pointer we're not really using, are we? So we can probably lose mem pointer and fix the bit of code that used it. Because mem pointer should always get reset to zero when we do a hard reset on the CPU, which we always do before every test. Here. going to want to return our values back so if we return a, a tuple of um, 
nothing. Failing. And. Not implemented, is it? What we called? Not implemented. And that's wrong. That's what we need to return. This should be. Don't mind passing tuples back when they get more than a couple and they're quite complicated. Then I probably want, don't want to pass tuples back. And I'm going to say that um, passing. Okay, and then we can go over to our test. Got our results there. And uh, where's it gone? Good. And then we can say um, we can put our breakpoint here now, can't we? Right. Because we're fooling ourselves with that past test. I do need to put some asserts on there uh, to make sure that we get the right results. They're not, it's not, I'm going to put an ignored on it. So we're saying failing 27, not implemented 898. But I thought I'd done more than that, I must admit. And then passing 431, which is quite the figures I had written down, so that's good. Um, we can say um, 
Soul Top Debug. Console. That console dot debugger thing. Debug was a thing. Oh, it was the sharp console. So Copper Verdi, good night. Good, good, uh, good to see you in the stream. Thanks for joining. I'll probably catch up with your stream if you're streaming tomorrow. Um, lots of streamers. Shield Samus says um, on Twitch get deals with Mix and Facebook gaming. I've had a Lucas off of yet. Yeah, 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 I'm sure. I'm not. I don't think I'm going to get any kind of offer like that, am I? <laughs> got me. I've got me esports jersey on there. So just as it just popped into uh, into uh, chat there. Got my. I'm, I'm all kitted out with esports gear. So, as you know, I'm a member of the live coders, so I've got that uh, got the live coders um oh debug debug C sharp no, that's not right. Debug right. Debug dot right is it? Oh it is. I knew there was something called that. Debug dot right line? There we go. This will print it out into my debug window at least. Code not implemented. Okay. Yeah. Make sure that works okay. Run that. So it should appear in the debug window. Did it? Not convinced it did. System diagnostics, I've got that. Uh, view output. Hmm. Oh, I've got to debug it, haven't I? Can't, can't run it in. Not in debug mode. <laughs> Code challenges tomorrow. Couple of beer. Don't look forward to that. As mentioned in Slack, lots of questions on advent of code. Yes, so I've heard about this advent of code, and it sounds most interesting. Here we are. There we got the results I wanted. Passing tests there. Adding tests. Passing um, tests. And you say that it's uh, a lot of it's creating a virtual CPU, which is basically what I'm doing. So um, they kind of stolen my thunder a bit, haven't they? Really, with that. So my my project 
um, it's less less um, unusual perhaps now people are doing Advent Co but I would have joined in with it if I'd have the opportunity to actually code for 25 days straight on things which are other than work and if it wasn't the fact that I had all these other um, projects that I'm working on so and there's this one obviously there's the um, the M M mix simulation um, there's also um, the shaders we're working on and also as uh, .NET 3 uh, .NET Core 3.1 was released um, last week I did spend some time converting some of my things across so I've converted the bots now running on 3.1 these projects are 3.1 and the synthesizer is running on 3.1 as well yeah um, so you see you, look, you looked at uh, I've been code to help a guy and then someone in one of the discord channels kind of um, started demanding help and, and then today has, has kind of done a table flip and um, stormed off because nobody helped him He's trying to write a chatbot in Python and I don't think any of the people that um, I know who stream necessarily wrote their chatbots in Python there might be some yeah it was funny um, and then I've also had um, quite a lot of interaction um, with a, a chap who's doing some JavaScript and only uh, only on Sunday the twig he was actually um, a student and I was doing his homework for him so I, that's when I said sorry too busy to help you there anymore because um, I generally speaking I will give people pointers on homework but I won't look at their code necessarily or, or change their code um, but he kind of I didn't twig that he was a um, he's actually giving me his homework problems. Um, so you're going to be quite careful about that kind of thing as a as a streamer or, or on Discord. Um, most of the help that we kind of should give out would be kind of pointers, advice, um, maybe kind of point out an error in your code. But um, I don't think we're, we're we're certainly not here to to do your homework for you. So um, if you are looking for that kind of support. Um, I'm sure there are other services on the internet. You can get you, you can get sucked in, Fuel Snable. That's absolutely right. And I don't mind helping people. I help people um, all the time. And sometimes I've spent quite a long time working with people um, uh, through Discord um, to sort problems out. But I do draw the line at doing people's homework because the homework is there for them to learn, not for me to do their homework for them. And um, so that the guy in 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 the Discord credit, he did want to understand. He didn't want to just copy and paste code. But being pointed at other people's code is not saying go and go and cut and paste their code. It's go and read their code and understand what they're doing. Maybe it'll sort out your problem. So yeah, you've got to help people to help yourself themselves. Absolutely. Um, you can't if they're in a university course or a college course. It, it's absolutely pointless solving their their problems totally for them. It's about giving them pointers or helping you with understanding uh, that, that's really so important okay well so what's the time now it's, we've been going there for just a tad over three hours and it's got to a reasonable position here we've got a validation tester um, running uh, it gives, gives us some results it needs some it desperately needs some tidying up it's we found a few um, bugs uh, which, which is obviously the point of testing to find our bugs um, and I've got some I've got locked was it 27 things to investigate I've also got to look at how we how I um, know how many steps to run the CPU for I'm kind of thinking I'm going to need some kind of actually interesting very interesting just a second i think we might the problem is the program counter how do i know how do i know if i run the if i run the cpu for too long my program counter will never match the program counter in the expected results file that is the issue with just running so I could run through, you know, I say run 10, 10 um, steps or run 100 steps or 1,000 steps. But my program counter then would be... 
totally wrong and it wouldn't match the expected results. Yeah. So that's gotta be thought through. How we do how I do where where we're looping and branching. Um, and I think there's the rest of the problems are gonna be flag issues. And it's really useful to have those those flagged up to me because um they're the hardest bit. Um but what I need to do is recreate the tests in my test harness so that I can um, I know how to fix the issue or know when I have fixed it. So I think that's a suitable um, topic for another day. It's po it's now there's a possibility I might stream tomorrow, um, and I do hope to stream on Wednesday as well. Tomorrow is contingent on whether my wife goes off to the cinema or not. If she does go to the cinema, I might do an hour or two tomorrow evening and then my usual stream I'm hoping to get in at uh, 4 on Wednesday um, but there's no guarantee um, basically due to the fact that I've got absolutely nothing done at work today nothing whatsoever and some of my colleagues also got nothing done and we've got kind of three months to complete the biggest software development project that we've ever faced um, and it's not just my team that's doing the, the work, it's like it's a business transformation project. Uh, but the kind of foundation is, is the software and, and systems upgrades. Um, so there's quite a bit of pressure on, on, on that respect. So I'm, so I'm not 100% sure I will be able to uh, stream Wednesday, but I, I do plan to, and especially tomorrow. If, if my wife does go out, I will stream tomorrow. Um, maybe come back to look at some more of these issues uh, because I think this is um, this is a really useful um, suite of tests that we managed to add to the project today. So let's um, let's just run the tests all once more, make sure that we've got no problems with our unit tests. So they're all okay. So let's uh, go over to Team Explorer and commit this code to our GitHub repo. So if you are interested in following along with the code, my GitHub repo is here. Um, so all the code on the GitHub is um, MIT licensed. It's completely open source. You can go and do what you wish with the code. Um, if you want to uh, play around with it, why not fork it and then create your own version and, and play around with that. If you do want, just want to take the code and use it for your own purposes, I'm absolutely fine with that. There's no need to put attributions in it in there. Um, it's it's code offered to the community uh, in an as-is form, for better or worse. It may not be the greatest code. It may be good code. I do try to eventually reach uh, a nice level of um, of refactoring, so the code is is pretty. Um, but we're in the stage at the moment with this this particular code we're writing when it isn't in that state. Um, the MI, MIT, not the not the WFT, <laughs> MIT license. The, the, the WFT license would be quite funny, wouldn't it? Uh, okay, so um, so added um, added validation testing tester using use tests. So let's commit that. And I'll sync that up. So, as I say, it's all up on GitHub. You'll also find um, the bot that we're running in chat. The bot hasn't done an awful lot today. Um, the bot has some interesting features, such as the ask command. Uh, what is uh, Z80? This uses artificial intelligence and um, and the uh, so <laughs> he d he doesn't know. <laughs> um, Let's try again. Ask uh, what is a Z80 CPU? Does it know that? There we are. It found it this time. The Zilog Z80. So we got that using it uses um, artificial intelligence, cognitive services, and project search, project and to search. I think it's called from MS uh, up on Azure to uh, sort that out and answer your questions. What's the meaning of life? It will answer, yeah, I think you can get to say 42 is the answer of life if that's the right question. 
Um, we've also got some other features in the bot, so uh, you'll know I'm a space nut. Uh, the default command launches will um, will show all upcoming SpaceX launches, but if you are a fan of ULA or whatever, or, or other space agencies or space um, launch providers, you can put their acronym. So you might well put ULA, launches ULA, or launches Rocket, uh, Rocket Lab. It'll tell you those. Um, so that's a, that's another feature of the bot. We've also got our adventure game in there. Um, there's other other kind of commands which you can find on the uh, the GitHub. Um, that's all been upgraded now to .NET 3.1, .NET Core 3.1. Um, there's a synthesizer project up in GitHub, which is quite fun. Uh, Fuel Stable has contributed a lot of the um, WPF code for that. And there's a bunch of other stuff. There's an Alexa skill that was built from scratch. I mean, all these videos. And there's 75. This is going to be the 76th video, which we're going up onto YouTube. Um, so YouTube is uh, where all my previous broadcasts are archived. That's my YouTube channel. Um, please, if you haven't subscribed already, pop up to uh, YouTube and hit the subscribe button for me. It doesn't cost you anything, and it really does help me out. And in terms of uh, following the channel, if you haven't followed, then please hit that follow button. And as a couple of people have very so generously done so far today, um, we're trying to get to the um, 250 uh, followers by Christmas Day. So uh, please do that. Um, my Twitter account is up here. That's Twitter. Um, you can follow me on there, and uh, you will get announcements when I'm going live, and usually kind of uh, 24 hours notice of what the topics were going to be. And I occasionally kind of um, tweet. Um, ruminations on coding or or kind of project updates and, and brief updates of where we are in various projects we're working on especially this one um, and any follows on Twitter are greatly appreciated um, yeah so let's uh, let's wind up wind up the stream we've um, pushed our code up to github so uh, we can close down that now and let's go and find someone to raid um, I'm going to move this so we've got a new dashboard on Twitch and so this is going to take me a little while to have a look at and see what we can do with it so where is the raid button raid channel there we go so um, it looks like um, the Michael Jolly is uh, streaming so Let's go and raid the bald beaded builder and see what he's up to. So um, do stay with us uh, and join the raid. If you are a subscriber, then spam um, chat with uh, Alfie Motes. If you're not, then there's plenty of other emotes you can spam chat. So let's all say hello to Michael Jolly and thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon. <laughs>